All right, well, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Rob Atkinson, uh, President of ITIF. I wanted to welcome you to this event on uh, USF reform. And uh, as some of you may recall, uh, I don't know, it's maybe six months ago or so, I can't remember the exact date, uh, but Chairman Janikowski actually rolled out his proposal, uh, his idea for getting to universal service reform right here at this podium. Uh, and uh, so I, uh, he knew we were doing this event today, so he decided to schedule his speech right after that so that he wouldn't uh, preempt us, which I uh, appreciate that for him. Uh, obviously, just kidding. But a couple of people suggested that we, uh, we, we actually make it easy for you. So at 10.30, we're going to actually we'll stop at 10.30 anyway, but we will actually show, well, we will try to show his speech uh, uh, live uh, webcast. Yeah, hopefully that will work technically. If not, we can pick it up later. But anyway, so we'll try to do that. It should be fun. Um, so um, what I want to do is, um, actually a couple things. Uh, I want to introduce our panel and I just want to make a few remarks and then what we're going to do is just we're going to actually just go down this order, uh, have folks make remarks. Actually, I may ask uh, Hank to go second. I'll ask Hank to go second, then Rick, and then Anna Maria. We'll go uh, uh, in that order, ask people to make remarks for no more than 10 minutes, then we'll have a dialogue and, and discussion with you all. Uh, also, if folks want to, uh, folks who are watching at home or at work, if you want to submit any questions a little bit later on Twitter, you can do that with a hashtag ITIFDC. So let me start with uh, Shirley Bloomfield, who is the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the National Telecommunications Cooperative Association. Uh, she uh, has 23 years experience in telecom, began her career on the Hill as an aide to Congressman David Obey, uh, served as an aide on the House Budget Committee, and then went to NCTA in 1986, and then left that for a few years, did a stint at Federal Relations for Quest and Verizon, and now came back to lead the organization. Uh, I'm going to uh, introduce Rick in the form of a question. Who is the Vice President of External and State Affairs of NCTA, and also the winner of Jeopardy? Uh, it would be Rick Zimmerman. I'm sorry, I had to do that. Uh, Rick is uh, also a member of the American Legislative Exchange Council's Telecom and IT Task Force. He's also been President of the Coalition for Technology and Education in Training, uh, former co-chair of the Congressional Internet Task Force, Internet Caucus Advisory Committee's Broadband Task Force, and uh, he worked uh, for nearly three years as the director of the telecom division for the Maryland PUC and also worked for the Florida uh, PUC. Hank Holquist is vice president of federal regulatory affairs for AT&T. Um, he joined AT&T, which was then SBC in 2004. He's also a member of the board of directors of the Wireless Communications Association International and serves on the North American Numbering Council. Uh, and last uh, is Anna Maria Kovacs, who is now a visiting senior policy scholar at Georgetown University Center for Business and Public Policy. Uh, but most of us know her for her uh, uh, solid work as the founder and president of Regulatory Source Associates, LLC, which provided investment professionals with an analysis of the impact of federal and state regulations on telecom policy. So uh, I'm going to get started, but I don't have a clicker. So Alexis, do you want to click the slides? Okay, there we go. Okay. So, you know, we seems like we've been ha talking about USF reform for a long time. It was certainly partly in the 96 Act. Uh, it started to tee up even more maybe 10 years ago. Um, but I think in some ways, uh, we really weren't ready to do USF reform before because the real focus of USF reform needs to be uh, shifting away um, from the PSTN. Uh, can you do the next one? Shifting away from, we need a new slide, uh, from the PSTN to, to broadband. And it really didn't make any sense to really begin to think about USF as a broadband support policy when a lot of people even in urban areas didn't have broadband, when, when there was broadband not even in a lot of urban areas uh, or suburban areas. But now that we have universal broadband, uh, it's almost everywhere. 
Um, over 70% of Americans subscribe. It really is time now to shift, obviously, USF to, to, to broadband. And that's really what this, uh, what the chairman's going to be talking about today. It's what the ABC proposal, which was, as you all know, was a group of rural ILEX and, and some of the larger telephone companies uh, had a proposal to do that. So in a lot of ways, we, I would argue, we are here to uh, bury the telephone and not praise it and certainly not to subsidize it. Uh, so it's interesting. I remember, uh, I think back in 2005, uh, what used to be the Progress and Freedom Foundation uh, had an effort to think about uh, next phases of telecom reform. And one of their subgroups they put together was on USF reform. John, were you a member of that? I think, I don't know if you were. Okay. I, uh, there were a lot of, Phil Weiser was a member and I was a member. And so I actually went back and looked at our notes or our, the final document yesterday that they had produced. And I was uh, you know, maybe I shouldn't have been surprised, but it was, you know, I thought it was, it was right at the time, uh, and very consistent with what we have written in our filing. So it seems to me there should be, a, there, there are a few principles that we articulated, and also this group uh, that PFF put together, uh, and one of them is affordability. And I think one of the key points is that uh, I think a lot of folks have conflated reasonable charges with equal charges. And... Uh, that really, in our view, is unsound. Um, not everybody should pay the same or have the same quality service. Uh, what you want is to have reasonable charges, and those, I think, should be more in high-cost areas. Uh, I actually pay a lot for my house in uh, Bethesda um, because the land costs an enormous amount of money, which I think is unfair. So what I'm suggesting is that we have a, a rural land tax and that that subsidizes my land price in Bethesda so that my house price can go down. Because I think everybody should pay the same uh, for their land uh, that their house is on that we could get for telephone. Obviously, I'm being facetious, but to me, the same principle applies. There are different costs, different places. They don't have to be the same. Uh, and obviously, the second part is we have to limit the size of the cap, which the EBC fund does, although some would argue it doesn't limit it enough. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that there have been some criticisms of the, uh, of the plan by some consumer groups because it has a ch it will potentially modestly raise the subscriber line charge, and this would be consumers feel is a bad idea. Uh, but in fact, uh, if you cap the plan, uh, you, it net consumers are better off, not worse off, uh, and uh, basically they're going to be paying less for long distance and, and, and other fees, wireless, and, and more for uh, the subscriber line charge. Uh, and I think it's important to recognize that this plan, and in, I would believe what the chairman is proposing, is not really about lifeline and link up. It's, and in fact, we need to make sure that those programs are supported solidly uh, and that, uh, in fact, some of the people in rural areas are going to be using lifeline and link up if, if costs go up, perhaps. But also, I think it's important to recognize if we raise the subscriber line charge, uh, which we should, uh, we're going to induce more people to go over to broadband, which is what exactly what we want to do. Uh, the second thing is we need to uh, be focused on efficiency, and that means raising the money in the least distorting way. And, you know, economists who have studied this for years have said this over and over and over again. Uh, clearly, the least distorting way is through the general fund. Reality is that's not going to happen. Uh, secondly, it's uh, very uncertain if you did it through the general fund whether you have sustained revenue. So really, the, most, the least distorting way is, is, is through th something like the subscriber line charge uh, that's not... Uh, usage sensitive to cost, but uh, long distance fees, for example, are. Uh, and then also spending the money in the most efficient ways. Uh, we don't want to have incentives that encourage uh, inefficient operations. Uh, we, want, we don't want incentives that fund multiple providers in high cost areas. Uh, and uh, in our view, we would want to fund uh, most of this, if not all of it, through reverse auctions with the most efficient providers uh, uh, getting the uh, getting the funding, and also, again, in our view, we would limit, uh, to the extent possible, ongoing support and really have this be a capital support program. Uh, and then um, third would be competitive neutrality. Uh, this, again, economists have talked about this for a long time. We don't want to be funding or favoring a particular technology, uh, but really be focusing on the best technology for the lowest price, regardless of what that technology is. Uh, 
And so with that, I will stop and uh, I'll turn it over uh, to uh, Shirley and you can uh, kick us off. Feel free to, if you want to do it from there or from here, whatever you prefer. I, I'm comfortable right here. Great. That's okay. Um, so and, Rob, uh, here's your mic. thank you very much. So um, Rob has laid out certainly uh, ITIF's perspective. And what I'd like to do is just very, very quickly kind of do a recap of, uh, of a little bit of where we are and where we kind of came from. So one of the things that um, the FCC, I think, really challenged the entire communications industry when they came out and they said, look, you know, we want to create a broadband plan that really ensures that we get broadband out to as many Americans as possible. And, you know, how do we do this? What's a roadmap for doing that? So when they came out, they really targeted, I think, some very key principles that they were looking at, you know, modernization of the network, fiscal responsibility, constraint of the funds, accountability for the funding that was going out there, and ensuring that there's some market-driven mechanisms. And I think they were very clear about what their perspective was on that. And um, from NTCA's perspective, and NTCA is a national trade association where we represent about 600 small rural telephone companies in about 47 states. Um, they tend to serve in the areas where, um, where AT&T and Verizon, some of the larger companies, didn't go originally because they're very rural, very high cost. The density tends to be between 5 to all the way down to um, 0 0.01 subscriber per mile of wire. So they're, you know, they're not exactly desirable markets. Um, but obviously we've got a lot of people who live there. So we provide service to 7% of the population base, but about 40% of the land mass. Um, so when you look at those maps and you see the Wyoming and the Montana and some of those big swaths of land, or when you're flying over uh, from the East Coast to the West Coast, there's a lot of telecommunication plant in the ground that's provided by, by my membership. Um, so when the FCC came out and kind of set up this challenge, we, we knew it was a challenge for us to kind of take a look at reform and, and recognize that USF needed to have some changes made to it. It's been an incredibly effective system, and I say that on behalf of the rural carriers who there is no way they could have put the plant in the ground where they've got it right now, and there's certainly no way they could have put broadband out there. My folks provide broadband to um, well over 90% of their customer base. Um, the other issue that we might get into later is the adoption rates, obviously, are a significant issue and, and lag significantly behind. So what we did as a rural industry is we came together with all of the other associations that represent rural carriers and, um, and really tried to take the, the FCC's challenge and come up with how can, we, how can we create a budgetary constraint within USF that makes sense? Um, a cap is tough, and, and frankly, for our sector of the industry, a cap doesn't work. But how do you do something where it's a budget, where you're creating some fiscal restraints, and at the same time, acknowledging the fact that um, if you really do have that dual goal of getting broadband out to all Americans and keeping it fiscally responsible, you're going to have to have a little bit of a growth factor in there. So what we really tried to do is, is we looked at how do you have carriers live up to the carrier of last resort obligation. Again, my folks serve in areas where um, sometimes there's competition. There's not always competition, but you've got to have somebody who's willing to be that carrier of last resort and provide that service out to the last farm or uh, the last barn, whatever it might be out there. But also kind of look at market incentives. So, um, so the FCC really challenged us to come to the table, and we took that challenge very seriously. So one of the things that, um, just to clarify, the rural associations came up with our own plan. Um, so while there is a price cap carrier plan, which Hank will talk about in terms of um, the larger carriers, there actually are two separate plans. So the rural carriers um, have not endorsed the ABC plan. The price cap carriers have not endorsed the rural association plan. But what we have done is we've each come up with a plan um, that works for what we think is our sector of the industry to get broadband deployment out there in a very reasonable way. And yet what we've done is we've created a consensus framework that if you put the two plans together, essentially achieves a goal in both urban and rural America. Um, it kind of maximizes the impact. So just to be clear, it actually is two very distinct plans that have been filed. So, um, so that has been filed with the FCC. And you know, one of the things that we face in the rural industry is um, again, I have 600 telephone companies, so I don't have the luxury of you know, being able to walk into the boardroom and say this is the way we're going to go. With 600 companies, I've got folks in you know, Montana who have a four-month construction time frame. I've got guys in West Virginia who dig through rock. I've got you know, guys in Alaska who have an entirely unique set of circumstances. 
um, but all of them are very key to ensuring that their customers and um, their subscribers have advanced services. So we had to try to figure out a path on reform that essentially um, was finding that road forward. So, you know, one of the things that we've had to be very clear to our folks is that this isn't a perfect plan. Um, when you're trying to deal with 600 carriers, nothing's going to be perfect. But what we wanted to do is carve a path forward for them, a way that they could have some certainty. One of the things that we've seen in our sector of the industry is our folks have gotten very nervous about investing. So we have seen a significant slowdown in investment, and we've seen a significant tightening of capital markets. So those who traditionally have lent to my sector of the industry, folks like CoBank and RTFC, have really backed off in the short run because they're not really sure what recovery and um, revenue streams are going to be looking like for these carriers in the future. So we needed to, to get some certainty. We needed to have some incentives for continued investment. Um, otherwise, again, you know, rural America becomes kind of a, a wasteland in terms of advanced technology. So, so we put together this plan. Um, again, there's not a cap, but there's a budgetary constraint. So it, it does <coughs> limit the growth in the out years to about 2 to 3%. We think that's fiscally responsible. We think that's really important. Um, we also think that we need to make sure that um, we have next generation broadband out there. So how can we work with our carriers, given this now defined pot of um, resources that are within the, the plan, um, to incentivize them to continue to invest. The other piece of that, you know, conversely, is we have um, intercarrier compensation reform, which is obviously very significant to the large carriers. And, and one of the things that our sector of the industry agreed to is really dropping those rates down to 0007 over the course of a transition period. Um, and that's, you know, that's a big chunk of how my folks actually are able to operate in their role markets. A combination of USF support, intercarrier comp, really are um, the anchors of how they're able to do it. can't do it just on your subscribers alone. And again, it's one of those things that this country just has to make a decision about, you know, what are the goals that we want to achieve? Do you really want to have ubiquitous broadband service? Do you really um, have a national goal that everybody has the right to communication service regardless of, of where they live? So anyway, that was a long way of saying, um, you know, one of the things the FCC really did is they said, look, we're a data-driven um, agency. And so what we did is we showed data and we had our folks come in over the last six, seven months, opening up their books, sitting down with the staff, going through more than they wanted to know. They're all stunned to see how much we lose on providing video in our markets, um, you know, but and trying to explain to them that, look, the reason we do things like video um, is first of all because we need to give our, you know, a lot of cases we don't have any other video providers out there. Um, and they become kind of the one-stop shop in these rural communities. About 200 of my companies um, have a wireless play. Well, it's the same reason. There, you know, there's companies that haven't built out in these markets. So, you know, again, trying to work with the FCC um, on getting that out there. You know, and one of the things now, you know, the stage that I think we've been at lately um, we put the plans out there. They've been digesting those. We have been working very hard on explaining what, what the rules could be like. Implementing this is very complicated, you know, but I do honestly think the stars are aligned. I, I have been in this industry a really long time. Um, the fact that we are at kind of the goal line on universal service reform, the fact that, that you know, we're working with AT&T and with Verizon and CenturyLink and all these other carriers trying to, trying to figure out a path forward, um, you know, this would have been really hard to have predicted five years ago. But I think everybody in the industry realizes that, you know, the way to go forward is to, is to figure out some of those areas of commonality, to really do this on a data-driven process. And I kind of look at universal service and intercarrier compensation as like a squishy ball. You know, you squish one end, it's going to pop out somewhere else. Um, and the thing, again, for my folks is ensuring that they have um, incentives out there, that there's some predictability in their markets. Um, and that they uh, are able to, to continue to promote and, and deploy broadband. And we'll get to uh, how we actually get customers to adopt that broadband once it's built later on, hopefully, in the discussion. But that's, okay. you know, a quick snapshot of where we are. Great. Thank you, Shirley. Hank. Thanks, Rob. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, I'd like to start by... Um, saying it really is a momentous day that uh, the FCC Chairman Janikowski today apparently will um, shortly talk about the plan that he is circulating among his fellow commissioners. I think both the chairman and ultimately all the commissioners will deserve a lot of credit for tackling this issue. It is an extremely complex issue. It is, you know, I've been around telecom a long time. I honestly think 
this is probably the most complicated set of issues to get your arms around and understand how all the piece parts affect other piece parts. Um, I think I'd like to say, Shirley, I think, I hope you're right that the stars are aligned. I think they're as aligned as they're going to get. Um, we're probably, honestly, if, you, if, if it doesn't happen this time, you know, given the political calendar, it'll be another three or four years before there's another serious run at that, at this. And by then, this industry is going to be a lot different. Um, not sure exactly what that would look like if we don't get this done now. Um, I think Rob did a great job of um, enunciating some principles that really everyone has to have in their head as they think about how should we reform these interrelated systems of compensation and universal service funding. I think one of the challenges is sometimes the principles don't all work in the same direction. And sometimes you have to balance the principles and recognize that you can't maximize all of them. And, and that, I think, is again, makes this an extremely complicated issue. I think I'll just talk briefly about sort of why, why now, why this, why the ABC plan. I won't go into the plan of the rural associations, but I think if you step back and remember, where, where did we get to where we are? First on intercarrier compensation, this thing we call access charges. It really came out of the divestiture of AT&T in 1984. It was built on the objective of creating and, and you know, sort of maintaining the, the affordable local service in a world where we have long distance competition. And so it really, the charges that we call access charges are charges that come from this world of long distance competition. Well, now we live in a world where the voice market, at least the competitive part of the voice market, doesn't really recognize this distinction between local voice service and long distance voice service. If you buy service from one of Rick's companies or if you buy wireless service, you buy a service that lets you call anywhere. There's, so we have a system where the intercarrier relationships are sort of built on a retail market that doesn't really exist anymore. And obviously this is a system that has to be wound down. The challenge has always been how do you do it in a way that does not cause unneeded disruptions in, you know, for consumers? And that's really the bottom line here. I think everybody recognizes that this system of tariffed intercarrier payments really has no place in a broadband world. And we have to figure out how do we transition out of it. Um, and I think the ABC plan and the rural plan provide a path to doing that. On universal service, I'll stay in the context of the ABC plan, I think there are two components of it that I think are critical to the world we're in. And, and I'll just tee up what I think are, are a couple of facets of the world we're in today. One is that the access technologies and network are far more heterogeneous than they were when, whether you go back to 1984 or 1996. I mean, you've got different wireline technologies, you've got wireless technologies, you've got different speeds, you've got different, you know, we could go through all the variations. And so you have a world where you have much more heterogeneity in, in, in access technologies. And you also have varying levels of competition. I mean, in the most rural, remote areas, there's not a business case for anybody to be a service provider without a subsidy. So you shouldn't be surprised that there's no competitors in those areas. The only reason there's anybody there is because you have a system that subsidizes the provision of service. And then in other areas, you know, you have dozens of voice offers in the marketplace, multiple broadband offers, both wireless and wireline. So I think it is a great challenge to figure out how do we do universal service in this world. I think the one thing that's clear is we can't do it the way we did it in the past, whether it was 1934, 1984, or 1996. That is, we can't do it through a system of public utility regulation of a monopoly provider who has a monopoly throughout some broad area. That system just doesn't work. So what the ABC plan proposes is that we very granularly identify high cost areas where there's not a reasonable business case without a subsidy, where there is no unsubsidized competitor, and that in equivalent, and we have the equivalent of a procurement, that the FCC says, here is how much subsidy is available, or holds a reverse auction, as, as um, Rob said, here's, and, and we determine here's the entity that has the service obligation for this high cost area, and here are their obligations. And it's set for a defined period of time. Everybody knows what their obligations are. We don't have this complicated system 
of internal cross subsidies in a monopoly business model. So those are really the two components, I think, from the ABC plan perspective that are the most critical, that we have, we, we have moved away we, from a monopoly system of public utility regulation towards something that looks more like a procurement, and we have done it at a very granular level, identifying high cost census blocks. And just to put that in context, in case people didn't realize, there are about 8 million census blocks in the country. So this is an extremely granular level of geography. Um, as I, I think at this point, I'll cut off my comments because I'd rather just let the questions you know, come. Great, thanks. Uh, so Rick, you, you have two precedents here finishing ahead of time. So we can see if you want to yes, <laughs> we'll see if I can do the same. Uh, so uh, Rob, uh, as others, uh, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Want to be clear for everyone that I am with NCTA <laughs> as opposed to NTCA. We are sometimes confused represent uh, most of the major cable telecommunications providers, as well as some uh, smaller ones. Now, both uh, uh, Shirley and Hank uh, mentioned that the stars are aligned, and uh, I thought about mentioning that, but I'm also wondering if it's actually a sign of the apocalypse that uh, <laughs> Shirley and Hank are working together. I think I mean, since, since, since I'm generally an, an optimist, I lean towards these stars are aligned. Um, and I do really think that, that not only that now is the time, but I mean, I really do believe that, you know, if not on October 27th, even if it's pushed back a little bit to the November meeting, that it really is going to happen. Uh, what the something is, you know, we shall see. Um, but I'm going to start a little bit by talking about the size of the problem and then a little bit about uh, uh, NCTA. I guess I, our, our members... Uh, provide or make available broadband service to about 93% of the country. And there are some places, as Shirley mentioned in particular, where there are rural phone companies offering broadband where we do not operate. So the size of the problem is something less than, I'll say, 5% of uh, the U.S. that doesn't have broadband available. And that's consistent with what the National Broadband Plan found and you know, they had some interesting numbers about what it would take to serve those areas, et cetera. Uh, but it's interesting, you both mentioned adoption. Uh, I've been working very hard on, uh, on broadband adoption of late uh, at NCTA and with our members on adoption issues. But um, just to paraphrase, if not quote, Blair Levin from a recent speech that, that he gave, uh, it's interesting that we are spending, you know, so much time, effort, and money on the 5% problem as opposed to the 33% problem, which is the adoption problem, which frankly we think is, you know, ultimately a, a bigger issue and, and worthy of more time and attention. So uh, so hopefully we deal with the 5% problem and move on and, and get to this other uh, issue. But um, but for our members, uh, what's uh, what's key and, and crucial here, uh, we make broadband available, as noted, to 93% of the country. We are a facilities-based competitive phone provider providing service currently to about 25 million subscribers across the country, and again, making phone service available to 85%, something like that. I'm not sure of the latest stat to which we make uh, facilities-based competitive phone service uh, available. So, you know, we can talk about principles, and that's sort of where we've started. Uh, I think the key really is the details, but I want to take off where Shirley started, and, and Rob for his part as well, which is that the chairman was here six months ago, mentioned four key principles. Modernize USF and uh, inter intercarrier comp for broadband, fiscal responsibility, accountability, and market-driven policies. And we wholeheartedly agree, and we filed a letter uh, jointly with the American Cable Association, which in some ways is an analog to NTCA. It represents many of the smaller cable providers, some of whom are also rural telephone uh, companies, um, and pointed out uh, for each of those four principles ways in which we felt that the ABC plan actually diverged from those principles, and we followed up with further filings about how the FCC could come back and really uh, focus on what's necessary. So I'm not going to go into all of the details, but just to mention a couple of the critical issues. One is the right of first refusal. So uh, currently, as uh, espoused in the plan, where a, um, a broadband service provider, provi a price cap carrier, will 
leave the rules aside for the moment, but you'll get your turn. <laughs> um, the uh, the price cap carriers, which Hank represents here for the ABC plan, uh, if they serve the an area with uh, 35% or greater uh, broadband, they would have right of first refusal on uh, subsidies coming into that area. That seems to us to flip it on its head. It ought to be where they serve less than 35% or whatever number the FCC chooses, you know, where the area is, where there is no unsubsidized competitor, that's where they ought to have the right of first refusal on where to move forward. Similarly, uh, there's no accountability, to use the chairman's term, in that the, uh, the basis for which they would receive a subsidy is a number spit out by the cost model. But this number spit out by the cost model would be for building a new wireline network. But the reason they're getting the right of first refusal is because they already have a network there. And there's no requirement that they actually spend the money that they get to build a new wireline network. In fact, they could build a wireless network, which, if you're Verizon, they already said they're going to do. So why would we be giving them money to do something they already said they were going to do for a technology that may not even be what is contemplated here. So that's just one example of some of the detailed issues that do need to talk be talked about. Another is, some of the thinking seems to be that in order to get the broadband dollars, you have to be an eligible telecommunications carrier. So we're trying to modernize the fund, shift from voice support to broadband, but you have to be a telecommunications carrier. That doesn't seem to make sense to us. I'm going to leave aside part of the discussion on VoIP and IP, but one of the concerns about the plan is the disparate treatment between IP traffic and uh, TDM traffic, a transition that we think is too long on the TDM side. We think in general IP ought to be treated the same as TDM traffic, and there are some speci very specific areas in the rules. Uh, we would argue that where we are terminating IP traffic, for example, or TDM traffic, we ought to be the pay paid the same as any other carrier for performing, in effect, the same function. But what we have seen lately, and maybe we can get into this a, a little bit, is some of the very larger carriers are saying, hey, your corporate structure is a little bit different because you have a separate entity that has the retail relationship with the customer versus the CLEC that is the, actually the terminating carrier we're only going to pay you part of what you would otherwise get because we don't think this guy qualifies for anything. And that's something that the rules really ought to be corrected to uh, uh, or, or should address. It's something that we're dealing with in, you know, uh, right now, uh, even outside of the ABC plan. And finally, there needs to be some reforms to uh, rate of return uh, form of regulation, which, you know, economists have recognized forever is not the most cost efficient or uh, uh, doesn't send the right incentives necessarily. Um, I, I will just say that uh, uh, surely when we first came in and sat down and you weren't sitting here and and uh, I said, oh, she's here, back here. Rob said, oh, is she in the gold over there? And I said, oh, the gold-plated network, here oh it is. God. I mean, I'm sorry, it's, uh, you know, oh uh, it's, it's a stretch, I know, but, um, but, you know, yeah, yeah, right, no, it was, uh, but, but you egged me on, Let, let's put it that way. So, uh, so there does need to be some reform to, uh, to, to rate of return and a focus on really, um, the, the last point I'll make is the focus here ought to be on uh, providing subsidy in areas where there are no unsubsidized competitors. So if we're providing service to 93% of the country today, you know, that's probably 93% of the country where there ought to be no subsidy for broadband. I, I, I will say that we have a few members that get some very minimal USF support. So maybe it's 91%, whatever it is, that's unsubsidized from our perspective, although they don't get money for broadband directly. Uh, but that's a large swath of the country that uh, probably should be receiving, you know, no broadband support at all. So let's turn right. it over to Anna Marie. Okay. Anna Marie. Thank you. <laughs> um, it seems to me that as the FCC looks at this issue, um, they need to look at it from the perspective of probably three different sets of consumers. 
One is it, the entire uh, base, I guess, of interstate telephony users who pay into the fund, which is to say pretty much all, all consumers of telecom one way or another. Um, it is in their interest to make sure that the fund is not any bigger than it absolutely has to be. And that interest in keeping the fund size down is obviously one very important constraint. On the other hand, they need to look at the needs of the rural community, uh, the, the folks who don't yet have broadband and who probably need it as much or more than any of the rest of us because they are in fact in remote areas where they don't have easy access to a lot of things that we do. So those two sets of, of interests have to be balanced. And then you have another group, which is a subset of both, which is folks who are low income and who can't afford to pay very high prices for either telephony or broadband. And it seems to me that those need to be considered in the context of the lifeline link up, i.e. low income fund, which is also being reviewed by the FCC on a separate track. But I think as we look at what is or is not appropriate in the way of, of pricing within rural or slick or whatever, the affordability issue needs to be looked at primarily in the context of the uh, low-income fund as opposed to becoming a constraint on doing appropriate pricing on, on the sort of major categories of product. And appropriate pricing, I think, is one of the most important things that this reform could accomplish. Um, as everyone before me has said, we're really looking at two sets of issues that are related because the Telecom Act asked uh, the FCC and, and states to take implicit subsidies, which are implicit in everything from business prices to intercarrier compensation out and make them explicit, which is what the Universal Service Fund does. Um, and that is necessary because in a competitive world, which today we fortunately have, um, you can't really support uh, subsidies. If you are making what used to be a monopolist but no longer is, uh, serve very high cost areas and average that very high cost over its entire territory, you're being unfair to their customers in urban areas, and you're being unfair to the company itself, which can't price appropriately in that area and winds up losing market share to others who don't have the same obligations. And losing market share is fine if it is because your customers prefer another service because it is a better technology or a better service in some way or other, but it's not fine if you're losing them simply because you're forced to maintain high prices that the other guys aren't. And I think in the context of the folks who've talked before me, it is extremely laudable that the cable industry has in fact built out broadband in most of the country. But it is still important to understand and, and done it as Rick has said innumerable times in my hearing, um, with private capital. It, it is also important to understand, though, that they have not been forced to do it in the high-cost areas. So in that sense, they have received a huge economic benefit relative to the phone companies, which have had to do, um, have had the obligation of building out everywhere. I think, as, again, as the FCC looks at how to balance the interests of the rural community and make sure that broadband becomes available to everyone with the interests of all of us who pay into that fund, several principles that are in the consensus plan that I think pretty much everyone has agreed are a good thing or worth highlighting. One is, in contrast to the current system, only one provider would receive subsidy, which is 
you know, the bad part of that is you're not subsidizing multiple competitors. The good part of that is you're not subsidizing multiple competitors. You are placing some sort of constraint on the fund size. Um, one of the most important points, and this is something that and CTA in particular has highlighted over and over again, and Rick, again in my hearing, has highlighted over and over again, is the importance of only subsidizing those areas where there is no existing broadband competitor. Where there is already a business plan, or where a normal business plan, normal investment will enable uh, build out, there's no point in providing subsidy. It makes sense then to subsidize only those areas where there, there's no way private investment could do it, and in those areas to use uh, the most effective possible technology. And this becomes particularly important in the super high cost areas, which I don't think anybody's really talked about. Uh, one of the fascinating things in the National Broadband Plan was the comment that a quarter of a million homes would cost $14 billion out of 7 million homes total costing 24. If you do the math, that quarter of a million homes would be $56,000 per year each. It, it doesn't make sense to spend that kind of money where satellite can serve, and there are some locations maybe where it can't, but for most of rural America, it is available. Technologies are getting much better. And one of the things that I think is a plus, again, in the combined uh, plan, consensus framework, is the reliance on satellite for the super expensive areas, in fairness to those people who pay into the fund. Um, in terms of intercarrier compensation reform, I think it is tremendously important that we finally get that done. Um, the discussion on how to get access charges down to sort of reasonable levels has gone on for the 30 roughly years that I've been covering the industry one way or another. And it has become more and more urgent because the disparities have become greater and greater. You not only have the peculiarity of very high rates in some cases for carrying a call from one part of a state to another, much higher than the, the rates for carrying a call across country, but you also have disparities between technologies. Wireless, for the most part, pays intercarrier compensation but doesn't receive it, uh, whereas wireline long distance pays in both directions. Uh, boy, it's kind of hard to tell these days what, what it does or doesn't pay, and when it is IP to IP, which is clearly where the, the technology and the industry are evolving, it doesn't pay at all. And yet, to a user, all of these calls look essentially the same. If I'm calling a friend, I don't particularly care whether I'm doing it over Skype or over a wireless or over a wireline phone nor am I particularly aware of the different rates that these carriers are paying each other. But it does make it very difficult for them to have any kind of comparability in pricing because they are getting all of these bizarre artificial rates. So that creates incentives for arbitrage and it creates incentives for investing in all the wrong places. Um, Finally, just to talk briefly about investment, which is the field I've dealt with for the last 30 years, um, I think one of the things that is most important, particularly to, to Shirley's companies, but I think to all of the companies, is to get to a point where there is some predictability. You know, we talk about regulatory certainty, there's never total certainty, but Companies need to be able to predict with a reasonable level of certainty what their financials are going to look like for the next business cycle, five-year, ten-year plan. And they need to be able to do that because investors demand that, because the banks that lend to them demand that. And so it is 
has been a huge problem that USF intercarrier compensation reform, the combination, has been overhanging this industry for several years. We almost got it done at the end of 2008. Every, ever since, there has been the expectation that it will come, and so the question of what will it look like. And I think it is tremendously important for the ability of this industry to get funding, both for the small and large companies, and even for the cable companies, the wireless companies. It is tremendously important that this issue finally be resolved. Great, thank you. Uh, so I have a couple of questions, but before I do that, uh, I just want to see whether uh, may, maybe Hank or sure if you wanted to, you, you had the opportunity, but also the problem of curse of going first. Uh, so if there's any, maybe a minute or two, if you, either of you want to respond to anything that was said. I, I do, but you feel free to go. Just make sure you use the mic. <laughs> Surely. Um, yeah, just a couple of things Rick said that, you know, I think I would quibble with. Um, one is first this notion that the, the cost model that the ABC group basically has um, gone to CostQuest to build is a model that kicks out a number that tells you what it would cost to build a new wireline network. It's really a cost model that tells you the cost of a network, regardless of whether it's built already or not. And it's a forward-looking model designed to tell you here's the cost of this network when you look at depreciation and everything else. So it is misleading to say that, it, it, that, that the number it spits out is only appropriate for a network that hasn't been built. Um, and Rick tied this to the idea that somehow the right of first refusal in our plan would in effect provide a subsidy to areas where we already provide broadband. And that again is not accurate. What our plan says is if there's a large area that we call a wire center that you serve a certain percentage of, 35%, then for those places that qualify for funding, which under our model are only unserved places, you would get funding. So there's no, there's, our, our plan does not include a right of first refusal to receive funding in census blocks where you already provide broadband. That, that's just not accurate. Um, finally, um, the last thing I guess I would mention is on this question of, you know, the cable companies are concerned that they should be paid the same, you know, for access. I mean, it's kind of a, there's, it's a very complicated issue. I think Anna Maria raised up an important point, which is I will be happy to sign a contract with Rick right now to pay them exactly the same amount for terminating calls if he will pay my wireless affiliate to do the same, the exact same amount. I don't think he'll take that contract. So, other than the fact I really regret my clothing choice today, and I knew I should have gone with that Washington black. <laughs> Would that have been more appropriate, or maybe red? I don't know. Um, anyway, just you know, hitting on kind of the whole rate of return um, and the whole kind of boogeyman that's out there. One of the things that I think um, was really powerful for the FCC again was the fact that my guys showed their data. Um, you know, we have shown our data. We have shown that um, you know you can look at the rate of return and you can think, well, there's this huge windfall. And I think that is one of the things that actually really surprised and was very constructive in the process with the Wireline Competition Bureau is actually seeing the cost, the actual costs that, that take place in these rural markets and also kind of debunking the myth of 11 and a quarter percent rate of return means 11 and a quarter percent rate of return because it doesn't. Um, you know, there's a lot of factors, there's a lot of state factors. And one of the things that was big for us and that was, you know, that was um, a tough sell in some ways to my membership was when we filed our rural association plan, we brought it down to 10%. So, you know, recognizing, you know, where do you find all of those different balances. So, so to that, and one of the things that um, was also really helpful is we had the chairman of the FCC come out to Nebraska this spring and had a great chance to show him what does a rural service territory look like? What happens when you fly in on a little plane in the middle of, you know, Beatrice, Nebraska, and then drive over to Diller, which has 300 people? And the fact that, you know, the broadband is out to the weather tower and it's out to the wind farm and it's out to the dairy farms and he's driving on dirt roads and it's not because, you know, I wanted him to see rural America. It's because, you know what, that's all they have are dirt roads. And I think it was a really great experience and, you know, getting to see some small businesses out there 
Um, and it is one of those things that I think, you know, you think you know rural and then you, you really get out past the airports and, you know, then there's real rural and there's a lot of people, there's a lot of businesses. And, you know, as we look at the economy right now, um, I, you know, I have huge hope for rural America. I think there's some really interesting entrepreneurial opportunities, but it's going to require access to broadband. Um, it's going to require, you know, the, you know, that's going to be some job creation out there in some of those areas. So, um, so any of you who want a field trip, happy to take you out to uh, rural South Dakota or any place you'd like to go. Um, but again, just kind of understanding, you know, the cost models are a little bit different. Um, and the one other thing I did want to just kind of throw out there that I think is going to be important about reform based on something Anna Maria had mentioned is, you know, there are some arbitrage things out there right now. There's phantom traffic, there's traffic pumping, all of these things. I think this is such a, you know, to me, low hanging fruit that the FCC could have dealt with. Um, but this is also the prime opportunity for them to go ahead and deal with some of these issues as well. Great. So let me sort of dig uh, deeper into maybe two or three issues. Um, one is the um, question of uh, first refusal, the right of first refusal. Um, on the one hand, you can argue, um, since we're really trying to base this on a principle of the most efficient use of funds and the best and lowest cost network, that why would we privilege the incumbent, do a reverse auction, whoever can win it, wins it. Uh, and on the other hand, I think folks might argue, well, because they're the carrier of last resort, there's some certainty there, and if you disrupt that, particularly if the new entrant sort of goes bankrupt, now you're left with nothing. So you can sort of both sides of that issue. What are folks' view on, on, on this question, and is there a way to square the circle? Thank you. Yeah, so, I mean, I think, you know, Rick raises good points. There are certainly, the right of first refusal is controversial. It's hard to come up with how do you set it if you're going to have one exactly, how it should be determined. I think it would be extremely helpful, you know, if, you know, Rick's members take the cost model, look at the areas that it proposes to fund, and, you know, if they would look at that and say, you know what, here's areas where we would do this at this price or lower. I mean, that, that could be really helpful information. Um, the other side, though, is part of this is about, you know, doing this in the most cost-efficient way you can. And, and this is a principle, you know, having this budget was important to everybody. You know, it's important to cable, it's important to us. And part of what that meant, though, ultimately, was per, when we look at our model and the costs, we cannot, within that budgetary cap, get service to every unserved location. It just, there's just not enough money when we look at the cost model. So one of the advantages of the right of first refusal and the way it would operate is basically what we modeled is what we call a fiber to the DSLAM network, where you would put fiber out to remote terminals and then you would provide you know, DSL over the remaining copper. Well, those remote terminals don't just serve the funded census blocks. They also serve a lot of unfunded census blocks, many of which have a lot of unserved locations in them. So the effect of if, you, if, if the, all the phone companies actually exercise this right of first refusal is that you would get 2 million unserved locations in funded census blocks are served by those remote terminals and another 2 million locations in unfunded census blocks. And any other competitive process where you don't have those existing facilities in place if all you did was auction off the funded census blocks, you wouldn't get to those locations in those unfunded census blocks. So when you think about efficiencies and getting the most bang for the buck, the right of first refusal basically doubles the number of locations that are unserved that get broadband. So let me start at the beginning. Um, you know, we don't think there should be a right of first refusal at all, but just yesterday, Today's the sixth. Two days ago, we filed a letter jointly with the American Cable Association on a modified version of the right of first refusal, sort of, I think, acknowledging the inevitable that there will be some form of right of first refusal, but how to fix it. It is interesting that Hank said at the beginning that it would be helpful if we looked at the cost model and said, here's the areas we're willing to go and how much it would cost, because that sounds like competitive bidding to me, which we think ought to be the alternative. But uh, let me also go back to what he said about you know the forward-looking uh, cost model, uh, et cetera, and the number that it spits out. Uh, the key is, you know, whether it's an existing wireline network uh, or not, there's still no commitment for them to do really anything with the money. It's not clear what kind of contract there will be. The, the big hook is the efficiency, he says, of doing it now. But in our view, 
they've built this cost quest model, or cost quest has built the model for them. We don't know if the FCC is going to accept that model. It will have to be put out for comment. We haven't looked at it yet. Um, you know, they're, they're, they've only just recently uh, made it available under certain terms of confidentiality, et cetera, to look at parts of the model. But we don't know whether that's even the model that the FCC will ultimately adopt. They've got to work through what kind of contractor is going to be with uh, carriers that receive money. So it's not clear to me that it's actually more efficient and going to be faster to give the money uh, to them in the first place. But the other way in which it's not efficient is that it would lock out potentially more efficient competitors and uh, essentially deny competition to, um, to subscribers or residents of the areas which receive funds through the right of first refusal for 10 years. What's going to happen in 10 years, you know, we don't know. We've suggested six years, uh, moving it down to six years. Frankly, it probably ought to be lower, uh, but we came up with six years as an appropriate time frame rather than 10 years to lock out competition, to lock out the potentially more efficient providers. So there are a whole host of issues uh, with the right of first refusal. Those are just uh, a few of them that, uh, you know, that we would throw out there right now. And, you know, would obviously commend to everyone our very short three-page letter uh, maybe I should read the whole thing. <laughs> Pass it around. Right. People. So, did you want to comment, Anna Marie? You don't have to. If you wanted to, you can. No, I'll, okay. I'll leave this. So, so let me just come come back. One last question on this, um, Hank. It, it, on, on the one hand, since you already have a wire uh, on the telephone network out to somebody's house, and you, you're not having to build a new wire, you're just really getting the fiber to the D slam, and then you lower your DSL distance uh, to allow broadband, why, why, help me understand why that wouldn't automatically sort of give you an edge, and not an unfair edge, it's just an edge because you're not having to put a new wire to every home. Why wouldn't that, why, why is right of first refusal even necessary in those situations? Wouldn't you be able to win any reverse auction or be competitive bid because you just have the lower cost, you're not having to build all of your infrastructure? I think that I think that certainly is possible. I mean, I think that there are again there are competing things here, competing things that you want to balance to get an outcome. I mean, if if we had a competitive process that we're ready to roll now and we could get it done and we could by July first be providing funding and starting to build broadband, you know, I think that sounds pretty good. Um, but I think if you talk to staff at the commissioner and how long will it take to get a competitive process? in place running operating funding broadband they're not going to say it'll be in place by july they're going to say it's going to take us some time how long well we'll see i mean my guess is it's going to take north of 18 months um, so in terms of a speed issue i think the right of first refusal has value i think again i do think it would be helpful if you know rick's members and i i, I totally agree we have just recently made the model available I'm not saying they should already have told us this, but I think ultimately if the FCC does change the right of first refusal in order to respond to the concerns Rick has raised, the cable guys better show up for these auctions. If we wait two years and none of them show up and bid on this stuff, I think that'll just show that we wasted a lot of time. Can I also just add, you know, we um, have historically been very concerned about reverse auctions and the impact, and I... I think it's been a little bit of a sense of a, you know, will it become a race to the bottom? Um, so we have been opposed to it, but you know, I do think, you know, what it, what do you do in the world of, you know, the rural rural divide? The fact that you do have rural America served by different carriers, you know, if you, you know, I guess I worry about an overlying um, policy that would implement this, not knowing. I mean, there's so many unknowns, and you think about how important the infrastructure, the telecommunications infrastructure is. But, you know, what do you do about those areas that Hank had mentioned that, you know, that 5% that, you know, the community, you know, the, the ranch on top of the mountain or those really far out places that are truly unserved today? And the question becomes, how do you in a cost effective way get to some of those? And if you were going to do a trial run, um, because I think this is a really dangerous thing to do without knowing how it's going to work. If you were going to do a trial run, I could see doing it in those really unserved areas um, where those folks, you know, I can't foresee any model, even under a subsidized model that, that we operate under, those folks getting service. So it's just food for thought. I'm going to agree and disagree, if I might. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Which is, 
uh, no problem with, uh, you know, a pilot test, whatever it is, with, but I'm not sure those are the areas that you would want to do it since, uh, since realistically, um, you know, as Anna Maria pointed out, uh, the National Broadband Plan showed that, you know, the last quarter million costs $14 billion, uh, and those aren't the place, I mean, the, the subsidy amount required, competitive bid or otherwise, is going to be, you know, insanely high. Rather, it should be those areas that, you know, are on whatever the outskirts are of served areas as opposed to, you know, bring it to the mountaintop. Um, but in the same vein, to respond to something that uh, Hank said earlier, which is that the budget for the plan, you know, barely contemplates getting all unserved areas served. And a, I would say it shouldn't, you know, uh, for exactly the reason that was just discussed. It should not say. We know it's, uh, you know, even... Even if it's off by a slight factor of magnitude, this fourteen billion, you know, it's billions and billions to get the last, to get every single. Even on the phone side, we don't have every single household in America after however many years it's been with phone service available. Now, for some people, that's by choice. They're you know they've moved away. But um, but having said that, the plan shouldn't contemplate it. Trial run, fine, but not in those places that we know are in the most incredibly Henry, expensive. Before you to serve. Do that because I want to. I want to poll the panel on this on this point real quick. So, we, we actually don't even have every college and university on wireline phone because uh, my son goes to a little little teeny school called Deep Springs, and it's in the middle of nowhere in the California desert. And they actually have some wireless relay that was hooked up when the Ruskies were there <laughs> planning for the test ban treaty. And so, I want fiber optic cable to uh, Deep Springs University, and any plan that gets that, I'll support. Yeah, they, should join, <laughs> they should join Blair Levin's Gig U project yeah, exactly. and uh, yeah, get a gigabit yeah, yeah. network to, uh, to Deep Springs. All 24 <laughs> students. Uh, but my serious question is so, I agree with what Rick just said on the there's a there's a cost curve and it gets pretty steep and you got to cut that at some point and you know where you cut it is is it but does everybody agree with that point that you know really at the end of the day for, at least in the foreseeable future we're not going to put wireline or, or even terrestrial wireless uh, broadband to every home we shouldn't subsidize that right now is everybody everybody with you don't have to be I'm just polling people to see if that's I'll go first I am. Okay, uh, Hank, uh, saw Yeah, I mean, I think it's inherent in the things you set out at the start, you know, Rob, that we have to balance, you know, and, and as Anna Maria said, you've got the interests of the people who pay into the fund, you've got the interests of the rural people who, who you know, live in areas that the market will not serve, and you have to find a balance. And I think where we are today in, in, in this Universal Service Fund is the balance is around four and a half billion dollars available for this per year. And in that number, I think, you know, you just have to look at what's affordable, treat this, you know, just very dispassionately. And I think it's hard to justify for the, you know, that top X percent, whatever you sure. say that is. Okay. Right. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. um, going back, I guess, to, to Rick's comments, it seems to me that he said a couple of things in his various comments that don't quite go together. One of which is wanting the right of first refusal uh, in the highest cost unserved uh, census blocks, and the other being uh, that ETC obligations don't belong in the broadband world with the... Imp Please let me yes, finish. Yes, and then I'll clarify what I meant with the implication that obligations are still going to be left for the ILAC, at least for the voice world, which is something I believe I saw in one of the, NC the longer NCTA filings that were recent. And there are several problems with that, one of which is it seems to me that there should not be obligations where there is no funding as a matter of principle. But as a practical matter, uh, you may not have the ILEC surviving in that situation where cable comes in to a high cost census block with the subsidy for building out, takes a lot of the ILEC's uh, 
customers taking end user revenue as well as subsidy that the ILEC has been there, you can't assume they're going to be there. So I think one of the things that really needs to be established is the principle of whatever appropriate obligations are in the broadband world, and they may very well be very different from what they were in the traditional world, you can't assume simultaneously that you'll take funding away from the incumbent, but expect that the incumbent is going to be there to provide service that's been there to provide in the past. So, uh, well, I, I don't, yeah, I don't really think I'm going to disagree with that, but just to be clear, uh, you know, we haven't insisted that carrier of last resort obligations remain. We have said in the context of our petition uh, a year and a half ago when we suggested that USF support be uh, taken away where there is an unsubsidized competitor, to the extent there is a carrier of last resort obligation, that ought to be accounted for in the funding mechanisms. But the whole point of the ABC plan, and I guess to some extent I haven't studied as much the rural plan, uh, and the chairman's comments and everything else, is transitioning to broadband, taking support away from legacy voice, and uh, to the extent that you know we receive broadband funds and there's some <laughs> obligation associated with it, that's fine, but that doesn't mean it needs to be the eligible telecommunications carrier obligations of today, which are provide a separate basic, I, I mean, I can't, you know, I'm sure Hank could spell the enough. exact. The non-supported uh, services. Yes, the night, right, all, all of those things. <laughs> Dual-tone, multi-frequency dialogue. Right, which, you know, is that really necessary anymore? And in a broadband world, you know, I, I mean, yes, there's that small percentage of places where we provide broadband, but not VoIP, you know, for the moment, and that may be more to do with, you know, rural interconnection or who knows what. Uh, but but presumably, if we're providing broadband in the future, there's going to be some, you know, voice component, if not a single line, separate, you know, available, non-bundled, whatever. So the point is, the obligations of today in the voice world are not the obligations that make sense in the broadband world, although we agree there ought to be some obligation if you're getting money. That's not a problem. So let me do one more uh, issue, maybe just quickly, and then we'll open it up. Um, one, I think the, one of the more opaque and confusing issues on all this is around uh, uh, ICC for VoIP and uh, uh, IP traffic. And, you know, it seems to me that when I make a Skype call to my son and, uh, in, uh, actually, I can't make a Skype call to him, but, but if I could make a Skype call to him. Uh, Why did he go to school here? Is this to get away from you? Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> the farthest on the 48 states that he can he avoid me. And he can't call me all that often. And I can't, I can't call him. No, it's an ideal world for More him. Uh, but when I used to do Skype calls with my son, uh, when he was someplace else, uh, it seems to me, to me, absurd that I would be, that somehow that Skype would have to be paying ICC charges on this. It's like it's sort of charging ICC charges on an email. Uh, to me, that's just voice and video email. It just happens to be in real time. Now, on the other hand, there's some continuum where I'm using the Skype call to inter interface with the PSTN, and that's, that's obviously different. And so, uh, to me, it's a complex question, but I would really not like to see a world where really IP to IP computer traffic and maybe even telephone traffic is just totally IP gets swept up into this. But on the other hand, you got to recognize that we're in this transition period. So, what are people's thoughts on that whole question? So, I can sort of give the ABC plan because we had in our group the complete spectrum of views on the appropriate compensation for IP traffic. At, you know, at one end we had Verizon, whose view is that, um, you know, there's no, in the current, under current rules, there's no obligation for IP traffic to compensate more than 0007. And then we had smaller carriers whose view is, you know, they should receive jurisdictionalized access on every kind of call, um, irrespective of whether it's IP or not. And this was an issue where you know, we just tried to find a compromise, frankly. Um, and so the ABC plan says, we're going to take all rates down to 0007 over some, you know, schedule. But one thing we're going to do at the outset is say, going forward, voice over IP traffic, the appropriate compensation is the interstate rate or local, if it looks like a local call. Now, there's not a lot of principle in that. That is truly a compromise 
after basically the effect of it is after from uh, I guess it would be on July 1st 2013 it would be the same as any other you know call that interfaces with the PSTN so there's you know under our proposal there's about this 18 month period in which there's a slight difference in the treatment of IP um, and so that's what we came to it's not you know I can't defend it as you know somehow it comes down from some principle of logic or you know it's really just a compromise I think the, the real threat here the problem is if we don't get some certainty on this, you know, if we don't get reform, if the FCC doesn't do something, we'll just continue to have the disputes that have plagued this issue for the last seven or eight years. And, you know, that lack of certainty, I think, is much more harmful than whatever the particular outcome it might be. Anyone else want to jump in on that? Rick? Or well, I, 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 Shirley? No, please. Don't. Yeah, I don't think I agree with, I disagree with uh, what Hank said, that we need some certainty. Uh, and glad to hear him acknowledge that, you know, what the ABC plan has done is just a compromise. Our view is just that, you know, there really shouldn't be any difference in the treatment. Either TDM also goes at the same time as IP, or IP doesn't go until um, TDM does. The irony of it is, well, the, several ironies here, you know, one of which is, uh, the more modern network obviously will be more IP, less TDM. But by locking in higher rates for TDM over a longer period, you reduce the incentive for carriers to move to IP, which I think we all think is the better you know, world of the future. So, so that's a problem with the current mechanism and the longer transition. Uh, but the other thing is, you know, it's hard for us, virtually impossible so far, to get IP to IP interconnection with incumbent LEX, which is something we would like. So we are forced to convert our IP traffic back to TDM, but then what we've had, in the case of some carriers that I won't mention, although I see them in the audience, is they tell us, hey, smells like IP, so I'm not going to pay you anything. And this is even in the case of, take one of our companies, Cox Communications, so many of you may know, they were one of the first out with circuit-switched uh, cable telephony pre VoIP, pre-IP, and they're still circuit switched in some areas. And so the carrier that I'm talking about is wrong when they say, it smells like IP, I'm not going to pay you. It's just like, hey, I think you're like every other cable, it's IP, so I'm not going to pay you. So we're involved in a number of state PUC proceedings about this, but this self-help is part of the issue and one of the reasons why we need certainty here. Uh, but ultimately, the goal ought to be, let's transition to IP, IP to IP interconnection, let's have consistent rates and treatment. Anna Marie, did you want to say anything? Um, uh, Shirley, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I was just going to add that um, obviously for our carriers, you know, the concern is how do you support building the network? And so it's all, you know, which which actually in, in my book raises another question that we haven't touched on today, which is the whole contribution factor, you know, and how do you address, you know, the incentives for building out that network and who's using the network and who's interconnecting with the network and you know, where do you put in the world of um, all of those who build business models, um, Netflix, on, you know, access, you know, accessing these, these um, high-speed networks and, and how do you help support the build-out of those networks? Because, frankly, it's kind of the chicken and the egg, so I, I just, you know, throw that out as well. <coughs> transition time, you know, frankly, transition time is important for us. We, we need a little bit of a ramp-up. This is going to be a big change. Triple zero seven is a big change for my carriers. So, you know, we need that, that ability to kind of adapt. Um, so I, I will say we, we did view the transition as being a really important piece of, of the compromise. So can I just say, uh, in keeping with the letter that we filed on October 4th that I mentioned, we filed a letter yesterday on October 5th on this very point. Uh, so I've, uh, you know, we, we have presciently, uh, uh, you know, anticipated all of the issues that we were going to discuss and filed a letter on each. And uh, here, one of the things we point out is it's not just the rural carriers that are losing money through going to 007. Uh, we, over that five-year period, about a half a billion dollars, that will be money that we can't then invest in broadband that we lose by an immediate transition. So again, if we, we either all transition or neither transition, but we're impacted just as much, and guess what? No access replacement mechanism for us. I, have to, I just have to throw out there that the, the range of opinion on this is what has made it so difficult. So Rick represents what I would say are, you know, probably the single biggest group of VoIP provide, voice over IP providers. There's another group called the Vaughn Coalition. They represent another group of voice over IP providers. 
and their attitude is that there should be no access chargers on board. So, uh, of I mean, course, they have no facilities. Uh, so all, they ride on ours. You know? All I'm saying is that this is an issue with a wide range of opinions that with no resolution heretofore and getting some certainty that is ultimately a form of a compromise seems like a pretty good outcome. So let me uh, open it up now to questions. If you want to identify yourself first, and if there's a question. My name is Bonnie Bracy Sutton. I belong to a group called Power of Us. I'm a teacher. We listen. I, I did not go to law school, but I was on the National Information Infrastructure Advisory Council. And years ago, teachers have been waiting for. We don't understand anything about what, why. It's when you go to Montana, you can't do anything. We tell everybody. Take education to the cloud. What cloud? What the hell are you all talking about? You can't get any, you can't even get dial up in some places. How can we make this understandable to teachers? I mean, I've done MLAB and I've done the National Broadband Plan, but when I drop down below Richmond, Virginia, I can't get online. So help me understand what to tell teachers who are trying to understand what all of these discussions are about. I've been to Montana. <laughs> So you got to come to where one of my carriers serve because okay. I bet you get great service out there. Okay. Um, and you know, one of the things, it's, it's an interesting point you raise about the education community. And, and I think part of it is figuring out how to connect. It, to me, it's a big puzzle. And how do you connect the dots and how do you connect the education community with the infrastructure providers? Because you know what? There is nothing that we as facility-based providers want to do more than get our services out there. Um, the other thing that is, I think has been a really interesting development, we've got about 26 states where all the local carriers own a fiber backbone network throughout the state, SDN in South Dakota, um, Montana um, Services Network out there. They've got, an, they hitch up all the healthcare facilities in Montana. Part of it is really connecting the dots. It's getting the educators in these states to be talking to the carriers. I'm, we're happy to help facilitate it. Again, in these rural communities, you know, it's just knowing who to talk to. What do your schools need? What kind of, and you know, part of the issue that we're discovering is the infrastructure is there. It's that the teachers don't know about it, the educators don't know about it, and then they don't know how to use it. So how do you take advantage of that? And then also, how do you work with these carriers to take advantage of all these other things that will help you on the back end, which is the equipment, the hardware, the software um, that the education folks need? And, and there's definitely programs out there. So there's a, a lot of ways we can connect. I'd be happy to talk to you offline about that. I'd, I'd like to just add, I, I mean, I think your comment is, you know, if the question is, you know, why are we doing this, your comment is exactly right. We have had in place systems that have not created incentives for people to provide these services in many rural areas. And i just like to go back to something I said earlier. If the, if the ABC plan were adopted and implemented, we estimate that there are slightly over 2 million completely unserved homes that would get broadband for the very first time in the funded census blocks. But I want to go back to the point I made earlier. There's an even a bigger number, another over 2 million more, that would also receive service, even though they are not in funded service blocks. So that's basically 4 million locations that for the first time would receive broadband. And, and one last point I want to make, because I see John P. High in the audience today, is about a million of ha and a half of those locations, the copper would be under 6,000 feet. So people ask, you know, what speeds could you get? Well, for a million and a half of them, you could certainly get over six megabits and you might be able to get up to 10 megabits per second. So that is a big change from nothing to 10 megabits. So let me actually turn it over to John. You did some very uh, insightful and, and early work on this whole question. So you had your hand up. You wanna... I'm, I'm in trouble if he starts with, with it. I did something insightful. Um, <laughs> John Piha representing no one. Um, actually, it was that two million number I, uh, that struck me that I wanted to ask about. So if, if I'm understanding correctly, there are 2 million unserved households in served census blocks. I, I was at the commission. No, unfunded census blocks. Unfunded. So they are below the $80 threshold that we set to stay within the $4.5 billion budget. That was kind of where we had to set that threshold. So they're an under the $80 threshold, but they are unserved locations they would be served by the same remote terminals that would be deployed to serve the funded census blocks. So you really get a multiplier effect in that you're able to reach locations that you couldn't fund you know, under the proposal. If, if, you, if you tried to fund all those census blocks and dropped the, the cost threshold down, y your fund would blow up. You'd be looking at a $6 billion fund. Well, so that begs, I mean, 
because I was in the commission when we struggled with served and unserved for BTOP and BIP, which was not easy. And uh, the answer ended up being based on census block with the knowing that rural census blocks can be vastly larger than urban census blocks. If it's two million households, that sort of begs, I mean, have we divided this the way we hand this out wrong that we are we are missing that number of households with the the direct approach that we are talking about and is there anything we if, if so is there anything we can do about it great question i think you know when you look at the universe of and this is another great thing about our cost model john i would really encourage you to start to play with it because there are unserved census blocks in every sort of cost cohort so According to, you know, this is based on NTIA information, you know, we're trying to use the best data we can get. Basically, you can go down to a $40 cost threshold, 50, 60, 70. You can find unserved locations in, in every cost cohort. So my assumption is some of those are in relatively low cost census blocks, but there's some exactly why they are still unserved, unclear. The higher cost you get, the more, yeah, that's, this is a density problem as you get to the higher cost areas, is the reason our model picked $80 was it was around the 95th percentile for cost. It, if you look at the hockey stick curve, it looks like it's around the place where the curve starts to really ramp up. Um, but, you know, th there is this problem that you have unserved locations below that cost threshold. And again, I think one of the advantages of the, you know, sort of the question Rob raised about spending your money most efficiently, and one of the advantages of the right of first refusal is if it were actually exercised and the fiber to the DSLAM network were actually built, you would catch a lot of the unserved locations that you're not funding. Um, go ahead. Yeah, well, yeah, I thought, no, not me. Well, I, I would just like to take that last comment back to the prior question, which is, if you actually do get out to those homes, you're also you're getting out to the community, which means you're going to get back to the school, hospital, library, what it, medical center, whatever you got. And another point relevant to to your issue is, of course, the school and library fund, which is a major piece of universal service, separate from the high cost fund that we've been talking about. So, so this may be a naive question. Um, but it seems to me with things, uh, with GIS and, and even just simple Google Maps, things like that, and the fact that NTIA asserts that they have much more granular data, this goes to John's point, why do we use census blocks? Why don't we go even more granular and micro-target those places that just simply don't have it? I, I don't, I mean, I think you could. I think, you know, in terms of a data set and a modeling cost and all that, it, it just gets more and more costly. I mean, this this model that we developed is really the first time anyone has tried to model cost at this level. It is the most granular cost model for this purpose that has ever been developed. And, you know, sure, you know, anything, the more granular, the better. Um, but ultimately, networks are not built to serve individual households or even census blocks. You know, that's the trick here. And that's one of the challenges when you think about technological neutrality is when you think about setting up an auction, Whatever geography you choose for that auction is going to work better for some technologies than for others. And there's no perfect answer. There's no right answer. That's why my point in the beginning was you can't maximize each of those principles. They have to be balanced in a way that produces what looks like about the best outcome you can get. But that's also why satellite is appealing for the highest cost areas. On the one hand, you have the fixed cost of getting the satellite up there. On the other hand, it can work for very disparate households over a huge territory in a way that neither a cable head end, nor a cell site, nor a, a telco wire center can. Great. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. Yeah. Um, hi, Hans Gunnar, Hudson Institute. Uh, a question about following on this geography thing. Uh, one thing that Census is looking at in dealing with their budget challenges next year is not releasing any more Census block data. Uh, would that create a problem for anybody who's trying to play in this market, uh, not knowing anything more? Or all you need is all you need is a map. Well, the map is based on the census data, isn't it? Right, but they, right, but they're saying well, you've got the map, but we're not, but we won't be in a position to give you any more data about what's going on in those blocks. They, won't, they won't update the data anymore because of the f fiscal problem. Right, right. Is that a problem for anybody who wants to play in this market, or 
No, all you need is, since they gave you the map, you have all you need. I mean, I, I would have to talk to our mapping people, really. I mean, I, I would suspect that anything you have internally, and internally I'm talking about whether it's the regulator, the company, the public interest group, whoever, any sort of database that you have that's built on census blocks over time will become less accurate and useful. And, you know, whether you will be able to um, change your practices in a way that maintain whatever benefits you get from that information today, I, I honestly don't know. I would have to talk to our dem demographic people. And, and I would just add that from our company's perspective, as they've gone into the NTI ma a map and to NTI's credit, they basically said, look, it's a work in progress. We, we have found a huge number of issues, and you may have as well, um, areas where my guys are providing broadband and have been, and it's not noted on the map. So, you know, trying to reconcile that and, you know, to their, you know, NTI keeps going, well, it's a work in progress, don't worry about it, you know, people aren't using it yet, it's not a finished product. Well, the problem is people are using it, and they think it's a finished product, and again, you know, we look at our service territory, and we know it's not reflected accurately. So, whether you're using census block, or, you know, simply, you know, flat out what you've got on that mapping, um, you know, that's always going to create issues, and as Hanks, you know, said, the minute you put it down on paper, it's already out of date. So, you know, how you use that as kind of a living, breathing tool becomes a different issue for us. I mean, the second iteration is definitely of the broadband map is definitely a lot better than the first iteration, but we still have some of the very same concerns, particularly with some of our smaller providers not being accurately represented. So um, with that, I think we need to stop, but I, I want to say a couple things first. One is um, this is a great panel, and I appreciate sir, I, these are, I think, as Hank alluded to and others, this is incredibly complex. There's no uh, optimization algorithm that gets them all maximized and, and, and uh, so uh, thank you for that, and, 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 uh, and I encourage and good luck to the commission for all those for figuring this out. Um, the second point is this is pay-per-view, so if you want to stay and watch the chairman, it's a $5 charge. <laughs> but we will be serving popcorn uh, uh, in the back as well. So but really feel free to stay. If, you, if you'd like to watch, I'm going to watch. Uh, you're welcome to do that, but please join me in thanking a, a great panel.